Your personal information is gathered and stored everywhere, all the time. Every single thing you do with your cell phone and your computer is registered and analyzed by companies like Google, Facebook, Apple and Twitter, to name but a few. All these personal data forms the heart of something called big data, a treasure trove of valuable new insights deduced from your location settings, emails, photographs, text and everything else you do digitally. This makes all your personal information very valuable. Companies pay good money to find out everything about you and they use it for a lot more than just targeted advertising. Your personal data can be used to predict the future. And that's where the big money is. Your money. Coming up on this program. Certainly we're able to find indicators of a person's interest in purchase intent that, that they may be giving subconsciously. The Google business plan is the greatest threat to freedom on the internet, greater than the NSA, greater than any censor, because it's directly making money from controlling what people know about. The key is um, to regard the data as an asset. It's something that's valuable, something that, that you have, and to think of it a little bit like money. This is Backlight. Welcome to the future. All your personal information that is stored and kept is worth a lot of money. The things you post on Facebook, the tweets you post, the photographs you take, the texts you send. Even when you do nothing, you produce data. And even that data are worth money. Until recently, Matt Hogan was a bond trader with a big bank on Wall Street. He noticed the price of data soaring, including your personal data that you now give away for free. You know, when I see all these people, you know, creating data left and right, you know, taking a picture, talking on the phone, dialing a number, you know, clicking on an ad, I mean, I see dollar signs for these people, right? I mean, I see the creation of value from this stream of, of behavior that they're exhibiting. If, if I asked, you know, this guy over here on the street and I said, you know, what do you do with your data? You know, he'd probably look at me and say, what do you mean? What do I do with my data? It's, you know, your data's on five different devices and 50 different platforms that you've signed up for. The plain fact is it's being sold right now and we get nothing for it. Other people are lining their pockets because it's this valuable asset, it's a valuable commodity. For all of human history, basically, uh, businesses were trying to sell products or services. Data was always used to sell physical goods or sell a service, but data itself was never the good itself that was being sold. Victor Meyer Schoenberger and Kenneth Kukier co-wrote the book Big Data, a revolution that will transform how we live, work and think. In the book, they investigate how the huge amount of data is changing our world. Now data gains its own value, gains its own importance, and so itself becomes a product to be sold, to be used, to be analyzed and thereby extract value from it. Uh, and that changes, of course, the revenue and business models of many companies. Your personal information continuously stored by numerous businesses, has become a commodity. But the going rates are very unclear. It's interesting that the greatest fortunes in history are being built almost instantly uh, on pe other people's data. And yet it's very hard to say how much the data is worth. Jaron Lanier is a big name in Silicon Valley. He initiated various startups and sold them successfully to companies like Google and Oracle. Last year he wrote Who Owns the Future, in which he wonders if we shouldn't be paid for all these data we produce. Even though 
the companies that want your data promote what they call openness. Facebook says, share, share, you have to share. Um, even though they want that, the truth is that their own operations they keep very secret. So it's very hard to know how much people have paid each other for access to your data. We don't know the total amount. We do know that it's substantial, though. We do know that the market values companies that collect data. So based on just looking at all of that, we can estimate that perhaps for an average person, some hundreds of dollars have been spent for access to their data in a given year. Um, for a lot of people, it's actually in the thousands. But there's probably nobody for whom it's less than the hundreds at this point. Every business now is looking at data as this potential source of value creation. We're seeing more and more people are beginning to realize that this data has tremendous value. But if you look around here at all these people, you know, people aren't, it's not necessarily the first thing in their mind to think about, oh, my data is valuable or any data is valuable. I mean, think about the world in general. If, if you're a producer producing some sort of asset or some sort of end product, you typically get paid for that. So it's very strange when you think about the fact that none of us are getting paid for anything that we do right now, but we should be. The mass acceptance of smartphones and tablets has made gathering and storing your personal data extremely easy and cheap. A lot of data are stored and kept without you noticing. Even if we control all of our information, almost perfectly. People around us can leak information that compromises us. If I don't reveal anything about my sexual orientation, but some of my friends do, then just by the fact that they are my friends and they revealed something about their sexual orientation creates a strong probability about my sexual orientation. The amount of stored data about you has risen exponentially over the past few years. All these data reveal things about you. A person like Michael Kaczynski of Cambridge University can learn a lot about you simply by checking what you liked on Facebook. I was, I was completely um, agape when I learned that you can actually predict whether someone's parent were divorced or not simply by looking at what he or she likes on Facebook. Uh, basically, um, what we did, we extracted people's likes and matched it with information that we had about people's personality, IQ, sexual orientation, race, and a number of other uh, traits. And we built a machine learning model, a computer model that was able to predict one from the other. Uh, what was very surprising, and very surprising even for us, was uh, the accuracy of the model. Some traits like sexual orientation, like gender and race, we're able to predict with accuracy close to perfect. So Facebook and your internet browsing stream, your behavior that is recorded by your cell phone, it all contains much more data than just Facebook likes. But what we did, we deliberately uh, limited ourselves to likes. Likes is kind of very generic kind of information. Moreover, uh, it's public. Your information, in some technical sense, depending on what country, uh, your information might be owned by you, but you don't have the power of ownership. You don't have the power to decide not to sell it. You don't have the power to set your own price. You have no power at all. You're, because the problem is that you have to click through on these agreements, or maybe you're just observed. Now, so the, But then there are third parties who aggregate the information and analyze you. Those parties control your information. Whether they own it technically is a different question, but they control your information. Right now, it's scattered everywhere. Your bank knows something, the government knows something, your phone company knows something, mm -hmm. Google knows something, Facebook knows something, your workplace knows something. So it's hard to say, right? It's certainly gigabytes of data. This is Alex Pentland. He's a professor of the MIT Media Lab in Boston and one of the world's most famous experts on big data. He knows everything that can be done with our personal information, and he also knows the risks. So this thing is it's on there right now. That's um, a diagram of my social health, my mental health. 
And what it does is it measures, without my doing anything, it measures how much socialization I get, how is my activity, do I have a regular focused pattern of, of work and life. And those are all things that are diagnostic criteria for mental illness. This has three things. It says social, activity, and focus. And so social is easy to understand, right? That's like, do you call up your friends? Do you call them regularly? Phones also know when other people are around because they can look at the Wi-Fi signals and the Bluetooth signals. If you imagine someone who's very depressed, maybe they just stay inside all the time. This was developed for soldiers. So when soldiers are released from, from the military, they come back home, they often have a hard time integrating back into society. So you know, if you see one of your buddies is not doing so well, you can give them a call. That's a major way to address things like mental illness. On the other hand, if it was the government doing this, it would be really scary, yeah. <laughs> OK? Six months ago, the American whistleblower Edward Snowden first revealed how the NSA has access to personal data stored with internet companies like Google and Facebook. In fact, as it turned out, these companies actively cooperate in sharing your data with the authorities. <laughs> I mean, um, this is just the bizarre thing to me, that people give their personal information to Facebook. They say, oh, I think it's very hip and very cool and very youthful and very freeing to just give all my information to some company in California. Mm -hmm. And then people are shocked, shocked, shocked that the, the National Security Administration, the NSA, has been forcing those companies to give them the data. You're shocked, really? That surprises you? I mean, don't make the stupid decision in the first place. I mean, this is, this is the thing that people are open to abuse and then they're surprised that they're abused. I mean, let, let's, you know, um, one of the things that simply has to change is people have to stop being so passive. Im Internet kann man schon sehr lange darüber nachlesen, was die Geheimdienste alles mitschneiden und das, was technisch möglich ist, auch gemacht wird. Nur, also man kann, man, also ich konnte mir das nicht in diesem Ausmaß vorstellen. Also ich habe durch einen Fernsehbericht ähm, erfahren, dass die NSA hier in der Nähe von meinem Haus praktisch einen Militärkomplex betreibt. Da habe ich einen lustigen Text geschrieben und habe dann im Namen des NSA Spionschutzbundes zum ersten Entdecken und Beobachten Wochenende eingeladen, um sich den Spionen zu nähern und vielleicht Freundschaft aufzubauen. Die Polizei hat sich ja äh, vier Tage nachdem ich diesen ersten Eintrag online gestellt hatte, bei mir also hat es an der Tür geklingelt und dann stand ein, stand ein Streifenwagen unten vor der Tür. Und die wollten dann auch noch wissen, was es mit der Aktion auf sich hat, ob das eine Demonstration wäre, wie viele Leute da kommen würden. Und ich habe einfach gesagt, nö, das ist keine Demonstration, ich will nur spazieren gehen und mir das Spiongehege und deren Bewohner angucken. Einfach nur dieser Zustand zu wissen, dass ich überwacht werde, bedeutet ja schon, dass ich in meinem Kopf, wenn ich denke, aufpassen muss, was ich denke. Ja? Oder, und dann, was ich auch jemand anderem sage. Wenn ich jetzt jemand anderem irgendwas sage und dann befürchte, oh, wenn der mich jetzt ähm, verrät oder was, was denken die anderen darüber oder ich könnte ja anecken damit irgendwo oder es könnte unbequem für mich werden, dann sage ich manche Dinge schon gar nicht mehr. Dann spreche ich auch Miss Missstände gar nicht mehr an, ja? weil, ja, ich... Angst haben muss, dass ich dann an den Rand der Gesellschaft gestellt werde oder so. So George Orwell, you know, envisioned this 1984 where, you know, people were being spied on, but they were being spied on by other people watching cameras and listening to microphones. And so now we have far more detailed measurements about, already, far more detailed measurements about people and almost all the people in the world also. That's something he could never have foreseen. Right now, there's something on the order of five billion phones out there. That means where well, you know every person on Earth practically is all of the time. You know who their friends are because of who they call. You know where they go, what their habits are. As we get to sort of more developed countries where we have credit cards and think you know what they buy. It's all, and so it's far more um, information about people than George Orwell ever had. And this is why it's important to think about who owns that data? What can we do with it? 
the fact that all these personal data stored by large internet companies like Google and Facebook can be accessed by the authorities has set off the debate about privacy again. But according to Jaron Lanier, the whole privacy issue is a hopeless debate. Well, privacy is in a way a useless idea because if you say I want to hold on to my data and keep it private, then you're not participating in the benefits of big data. Uh, if you want to say you can use my data but it's anonymized, you're still not participating in the benefits. And besides, anonymization is impossible, so it's stupid. But um, so privacy doesn't mean anything. In a sense, it's, a, it's not a useful idea. And it's, it's the idea that's driving government bureaucracies who look at this, except it doesn't make any sense, so they're all wasting their time. You know, and this, I don't know, I, I don't know what to do with this. I, I just w listen to privacy bureaucrats and I just can't believe I'm listening to people talk about absolute nonsense, which they can't define and can't do anything about. So, so th th what I prefer, <clears throat> instead of privacy, is I prefer to think about commercial rights. Because commercial rights are a form of privacy. If you, if you, uh, have, if you live in a place that, that's defined commercially, you have a rental agreement or you own the place, and that creates privacy. Um, so it's a way of talking about privacy that's much more concrete, where you can be very specific. You don't have to rely on philosophy. You can actually concretely talk about something. So what I believe is that people should own their data, they should be paid for it, and they should have rights to make decisions about the price of their data. As yet, you're giving away most of your personal data for free. Businesses are only too keen to store that information because your personal data are extremely useful. First of all, there's advertising. Your data are used to send you targeted ads. But the advertising industry is not what it used to be. Advertising used to be a form of rhetoric, a form of expression. So an advertisement meant there's a beautiful woman with a beautiful car, and mm -hmm. if you buy the car, you'll be around the beautiful women. It, it was always bullshit. Everybody knew that. And yet somehow we bought into it. And my personal opinion is that this type of advertising, even though it's ridiculous and annoying in many cases, has been essential to our well-being because um, people are habit-bound, and modernity has required people to change habits, and advertising has been the way that we've done that, and I think that's mostly been for the better. So overall, I, I'm, I'm um, happy with traditional advertising. I'm glad it exists. Mm -hmm. However, what we're talking about in the internet era is not advertising as we knew it. Instead, what this is about is micromanagement of the options in front of you. And so it's really not behavior modification, but behavior restriction. So what, there's only a limited amount of, of screen space. There are only a limited number of seconds with which you can look at any device you have, your phone or tablet or whatever. And so if Google or Facebook can say, OK, here you see this option, that is not just a question of influence. It's not just a question of suggestion. It's not just a question of, of um, making something available to you you wouldn't have known about. It's actually uh, restricting your options within a very narrow scope. It, it, so it's, it's a very important distinction. Because um, you once said that, that Google was not, you were kind of hesitant in, in calling Google an, an advertising company. Right? Yeah, Google is not an advertising company because what they, what they, they make 95% of their money, essentially everything, not from advertising that has any sense of style or any sense of persuasion. It's simply from micromanaging the limited number of options in front of you. Mm -hmm. So it's more a behavioral option management company. Brian D'Alessandro is a data scientist with Distillery, a large online marketing agency in New York. He analyzes the behavior you give away via your cell phone and computer. Every single thing you do, you know, now with mobile phones, there's every location that you visit physically can be recorded. And on the web, like I said, every website that you visit can be recorded. So these atomic little actions that you take are, in essence, what big data is today. It's, it's, it's every little thing you do. This person is going into Starbucks. So they like their high-end coffees. And this person is going to McDonald's. So they like their fast food. These stores are right next to each other. Mm -hmm. But the person chooses one or the other. Yeah. That already tells me a lot about that person. Maybe what kind of budget they have, mm -hmm. whether or not they're health conscious, things like that. Now, 
if you can follow that person through the whole day, then I have a lot more richer history. And with more people with rich histories, then I could really start finding really interesting patterns and actually use them at a certain scale. Yeah. Ultimately, what I'm after is understanding human behavior, human interactions. Big data is about behavior. Because an individual only has so many data points that describe who they are as a person. You know, how many demographics does a person really need to get a good sense of them? But your behavior trails, I won't call them infinite, but they're very long. Our firm is collecting data uh, off of people's personal computers as well as tablets and mobile devices. So when we collect in information about an individual, we're not really interested in who the person is. So I don't need to know their name, their, where they live isn't so important. What's more important is that this person is potentially looking to buy a new car or they're looking to buy a particular item of clothing. And so that type of, that type of information can be inferred based on your browsing habits. Certainly, we're able to find indicators of a person's interest and in purchase intent that, that they may be giving subconsciously. And that's really what it comes down to. It's predicting the types of products that a person might purchase and also the, what you call, in-market, whether or not someone is interested in buying something now. People often remark that I have the fewest amount of apps they've ever seen on a phone. I don't know what that says about me, but <laughs> it's, maybe it's I just, now that I, I know so much about how much information is collected, I keep it all private. <laughs> is, that, is that a joke or is that true? That's, that's more of a joke. I'm actually, I don't really care mm -hmm. so much that my data is being collected because ultimately I know it's people like me who use it, so I trust myself. <laughs> Human beings are very random. Your purchase decisions are very random. Your browsing decisions are very random. So the more randomness or noise that's, that's in, like ingrained in this process, the more difficult it is to be accurate. Okay. And there's, um, so there's always going to be limitations on how accurate these predictive models can be. Wall Street, for example, it's very difficult to perfectly predict if a stock is going up and down, but the way advertising works and the way Wall Street works is the, the transactions are happening at such scale that I only have to be 10% better than random to make millions of dollars for my firm. So if with just small gains in efficiency, you can actually produce, create a lot of value. And that's what it comes down to. It's, it's not about being right all the time. It's about being better than average and are being better than random and even being better than your competitors. As far as I can tell, unless we have every perfect piece of information about you and your state of mind at every given moment, we won't be able to predict you perfectly. Even you knowing everything about your, your thoughts and your interests probably can't even make perfect predictions. Well, maybe the computer will learn to predict me better than that I can. <laughs> it's possible with enough data. It's, it, you know, it's the, 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 the frontier of accuracy is yet to be determined. Predicting your behavior based on your personal data has only just begun. But already we see examples of how the algorithms of marketing departments discover things about you that you weren't even aware of or reluctant to make public. The New York Times published the story of a 16-year-old girl and her father who regularly shopped at Target, an American chain store. The father was surprised to find brochures for baby products in his mailbox. He went to the store to get clarification. Calls were made, and then it turned out that Target's algorithms had predicted that the girl must be pregnant before she had even had a chance to tell her father. But how did the Target computers know? The data analyzed by Target revealed that pregnant women tend to buy unscented shampoos and lotions 
because their sense of smell becomes keener during pregnancy. This way, Target can predict which of their customers is pregnant, maybe even before the customer herself knows. The internet companies uh, have not built a, pro a profile of you alone. They've built a behavioral model that's predictive, and that's a crucial difference. Mm -hmm. So a profile is static data. So that would be, and, and that they might reveal to you, that because it's harmless to reveal to you. So that would say, oh, you have this many children, and this is your income, and you have this car, and this yeah. is where you went on vacation. In a way, that's not very important. What is important is that they can correlate all of those things with everybody else. They can look at what everybody else who's similar does, and then use those statistics statistics to predict you. And it's that prediction that they never share with you. You never get to see that. They would die before they would share that. But that's the important part. And that's when they would say, people who are similar to you are likely to accept this financial offer. People who are similar to you are likely to be influenced by this ad. People who are similar to you are likely to get this disease. And all of these things influence tremendously um, both the offers you receive and the options that are given to you. This idea of the open internet, the idea that it's it, just in order for information to be free, we'll let advertising be the business plan. And that trade-off is terrible because what it means is that instead of exploring options, instead of being free to walk anywhere you want in the city of the internet, you're, there's, there are these people who are steering you and they're putting up blinders so you can only see certain streets because there's a limitation to how much you can see ultimately. And so if you're micromanaging which options are available, you're essentially directing people. So the Google business plan is the greatest threat to freedom on the internet, greater than the NSA, greater than any censor, because it's directly making money from controlling what people know about. The fast-growing amount of personal data, stored in data centers all over the world, is not only used to show you the right ad banners. Your profile and all the information associated with it, our data centers work and compile all that information and then send it back to you right across the open internet again, and all of that happens in milliseconds. Personal data are increasingly used to open up surprising vistas of the future in other areas too. An American hedge fund made a nice profit buying the traffic data of millions of Americans. They found out which parking lots around stores had been particularly busy over the past three months and estimated which stores were making a profit and which weren't long before the quarterly figures were published. And all the data produce information that opposes some of our current expectations. It is mostly about predictions or seeing patterns that we didn't see before. There are researchers at the University of Toronto, for example, who can foresee the likelihood of an infection of a premature baby 24 hours before symptoms set on. Um, and they do this by a big data analysis of 1,000 data points of vital signs a second that are being captured from these premature babies. Um, and interestingly enough, they found out that the the telltale sign of a likely infection 24 hours later is not that the vital signs go haywire, as one would expect, but that the vital signs of a premature baby stabilizes. And if they stabilize, then every doctor looking at it would have said, ah, wonderful, I can go home. This is fine now. But in reality, it was the sign, or is the sign, of a likely infection in the future. To me, this is counterintuitive, this is very powerful, uh, and this shows that predicting the future, uh, even if we don't know why things happen in the future, is incredibly valuable. It saves lives. Big data is mostly about people and about prediction. That's the thing that people haven't quite sort of grokked yet. It's like they think, oh, big data is about making the computers faster or something. No, it's about people. That's because people are what drive the world, people's desires, demands, etc. And so when you say, what can you predict about people? Well, people are very regular. If I watch you for a week, watch your cell phone for a week, I can predict with very high odds where you're going to be this afternoon, who you're going to be with. Your buying patterns are very, very regular. Over the next few years, our personal data and everything that can be deduced from them will cause major changes in the way we view the world. This can be very beneficial 
as long as it is for the greater good. But businesses can also use your personal data to predict your future behavior as an individual even better than you can. I believe that Facebook knows that you're going to split up with your girlfriend or spouse well before, before even you realize that, right? So uh, just simply by observing millions of people and the, and the patterns of behaviors, right? So Facebook can see how millions of people behave and then they of course know when someone splits up, right? Because it all happens publicly on Facebook very often. And what they can do, they can go back and observe what patterns of behaviors, how behavior was changing across the time. So they can, uh, and they, they can look very deep, right? So they, they know what you do on Facebook, they know whose profiles you're looking at, they know how often you message your spouse or girlfriend, then they know whether your girlfriend is looking at you or not on Facebook, right? So they, have, they, they know whether there are some other girls or some other guys looking at your profile in the meantime. So basically by observing your behavior, but also behavior of the people around you, they can try to figure out little patterns that might be indicating that maybe in a month, two or three, you're actually uh, going to split up, got engaged, or um, uh, get a depression, right? So uh, any event in your life or any of your traits, like your sexual orientation, your gender, your race, or the fact that your parents were divorced in the past, it will affect your behavior. And then the thing is that it affects your behavior in a tiny, uh, unperceptible ways. Computers have a huge advantage over human beings while being kind of a bit silly mechanical uh, devices they are also they have ability to perceive very minute changes in behaviors they can pick up patterns that are completely beyond the cognition of human beings and this is how computers are basically looking at very minute differences in patterns of what you like on Facebook what you do on Facebook they can figure out whether you are gay or not or whether your parents were divorced or not you can look at social networks mm -hmm. And you can predict uh, the GDP of the city where the social network is. You can look at companies and you can look at the social networks and you can predict the profitability of the company quite accurately. Mm -hmm. And if you change the social networks, you can change the profitability. So you can actually make cities better, you can make companies better through using this data about predicting how people interact. People's future behavior is highly predictable. One man who experienced this personally is Stephen Wolfram, a famous mathematician and the inventor of the mathematical search engine Wolfram Alpha. He has been gathering data about himself for decades and he analyzes them in great detail. He discovered that his analysis can accurately assess his future relations with his colleagues. One of, one of the shocking things I discovered is that uh, if I look at email that I've exchanged with people, particularly people I work with at my company and things like that, if I see a decrease in the amount of mail I'm sending to somebody, that's about a six-month leading indicator of problems. So that, that's a, now, so the real question is, do I set up a predictive system that gives me a little warning? And I haven't done that yet, but I'm not sure whether that's a, it's always a difficult thing to know how much you should sort of, uh, you know, how much predictions become self-fulfilling and so on. You can kind of see this is sort of the uh, daily distribution of my life, uh, sort of uh, when emails come in, when emails go out, when I type keystrokes, when I have meetings, when I do calls, when I take uh, steps, walking and so on. Lots of people, you know, wrote to me and said, how can we do this for ourselves? Yeah. And the answer is because they've been using things like Facebook, um, there is a lot of data that uh, they've effectively been storing on themselves. Right. And uh, so we, we've built some tools to let people go and uh, interrogate their, their Facebook data and, uh, and try and make sort of personal analytics conclusions about themselves from that data. Sort of like a 100-page book about you, so to speak. Uh, well, there's a... Oh, that's actually... One of my kids, my, my older daughter's um, social network. It's interesting to sort of see the story of, of somebody's life as drawn and, you know, this was the thing they did, this was another thing they did, and you can see that in the clustering of their friends. One of the things that um, came from the study we did on sort of broad study of Facebook analytics is um, people uh, follow awfully standardized tracks, surprisingly so. You know, it, it's... Um, 
Uh, now, on any individual basis, there are all kinds of fluctuations. But uh, you know, when you look at these overall plots, to me, it's quite striking to what extent they they sort of they look like they're just physics or something. It looks like it's just uh, you know people are uh, reacting, relating to each other, having getting into relationships a little bit like you know chemical uh, uh, molecules would would interact and bind and and these sorts of things. The curves look very much uh, like that kind of thing, and it feels very much like at least in the aggregate, it's very predictable. As we begin to have a really computational science of human behavior, um, then we can begin to design societies better, we can interpret the data better, and so on and so forth. And that's a little scary to some people, the idea that there can be a real science of people. Um, but that's how you build better cities, help stop wars. I think we need that stuff. Big data, with all its problem-solving capabilities, cannot function without the constant flow of your personal data. It can make businesses a healthy profit, but having all this data also provides power to who controls it. In today's world, the most common form of power is having spy data about somebody else. And it's a very strange form of power. It's different than earlier historical forms of power. Power has usually meant the threat of violence. What would happen is somebody would say, well, ultimately, if you don't do this, I'll hurt you. And it might be indirect, it might be complex, but that, that's how it works. The new kind of power is different. It's a very gradual form of power. Somebody saying, hey, you can do what you want, but I'm micromanaging options, so very gradually I'm steering you to what I want. I'm very gradually influencing the financial decisions you make, the commercial decisions you make, the education decisions you make, all kinds of things. So very gradually I'm changing the world, so I become richer and richer and more powerful. So it's a new kind of power that's very sneaky and gradual, but the thing about gradual power is it compounds like compound interest. So if somebody can use uh, spy data about you to just change your decisions to give me like 0.1% advantage every year, it accumulates until suddenly I'm very rich and you're very poor. So that's the new kind of power. So it's very subtle and that's what makes it so important that we understand it and so important that we change it. Over a decade ago, the science fiction movie Minority Report presented the idea that crime would be predictable in the future. Criminals would be arrested before they even committed the crime. Experiments with predicting crime are now being conducted in Santa Cruz, California. A company called Predpol has young mathematicians who help the police predict which places stand a good chance of becoming a crime scene the next day. Take a look, see where we want to go. Code 41341, break Santa Cruz Hall units, fire medical. We have an algorithm that we're using that will identify a sort of risk factor for each area, and it will tell you for today these few areas are going to be high risk. And we can use that to say, if you go to these areas, maybe you'll prevent crime there. You probably won't catch anyone there because if you're sitting there, no one's going to commit a crime in front of you. But um, we can use those and put them into uh, an equation we have that will identify the risk factor and how many crimes we expect to occur there. Watch this guy, see what he's all about. Why do you watch him, buddy? Yeah, you got a guy to your right here. Officers in the field, they will look at this and say, well, why would this program know better than me? Why, why would I go follow what this, uh, this algorithm or this equation says and just go sit on this corner? Because I know this city better than mm -hmm. this computer knows this city, so I shouldn't listen to it. But, uh, but we found over time, as we can show, that we are actually effectively predicting uh, dangerous areas that they will say, okay, maybe there's some merit to this, and they'll go and follow up on the areas we identify. Okay, Robert, what's that? 
So now we're coming into one of our predictive policing zones. It was vulnerable for burglaries, vehicle burglaries, and auto theft. So you finally proved that you, you and the computer algorithms might know the streets better than they in, in some way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't necessarily come out and cruise through this neighborhood uh, today. You know, I would go out and I'd go hit Ocean Street, I'd hit Soquel, all the thoroughfares, the main traveled portions of the road. I mean, that, that's, that's, what, that's where my habits would take me. Mm -hmm. um, they wouldn't necessarily take me through the back roads of this neighborhood. We started in July of 2011, and uh, so we then compared previous years of doing nothing versus our first full year of doing PredPol, and we saw significant reductions in our target crimes. And I, and I think really, I think our community expects that we're using the latest techniques available. Um, you know, you have such great shows like CSI that are showing us how, you know, they give the illusion that the police department can solve major crimes in 45 minutes plus commercial breaks, right? I heard the comparison to Minority Report a, a bunch, mm -hmm. and uh, gosh, we wish it was that good. <laughs> but uh, it's not about profiling individuals, and that's one thing that I think is very important about this, is it's, it's about areas. It's not about individuals. It doesn't tell you about who to stop, who to contact. It just gives you a location where it thinks you have the best opportunity to mitigate crime. And I think that that's an important distinction, too. Uh, you know, rightfully, you, you shouldn't, and we shouldn't be profiling individuals. Uh, there's certain clues and certain hints and body language things that they'll give you. I would say oftentimes if people are up to no good, they give it away. Yeah. They, oh yeah, there's, there's different body language things, there's different telltale signs about what they're doing, uh, whether or not they'll make eye contact with you. Um, there's a lot of little subtle hints that you watch for, and, and most people know it when they see it. You see somebody and they're acting suspicious, you know, oh, that, that guy doesn't look right. And they don't take the time to really break it down and say, okay, what are those things I'm observing that makes that person or this situation suspicious? Uh, you know, we all have it. We all have that intuition. Um, you know, as police officers, we learn to kind of break those things down and articulate them because we'll use that later when we formulate our reports and the, the courts and the attorneys will ask us, why did you stop this person? Well, I, I need to be able to tell them more than they just look suspicious. I need to be able to break that down into some definable things. It's a sleepy morning this morning. That's the way we like it. From a police standpoint, that's perfect, right? That's what you want. Uh, in fact, uh, oftentimes when I talk to the business owners, I tell them, you know, we want you to be busy. If I'm busy, that's not necessarily a good thing for the city. So in reality, you really want your police department to be bored. Is it because of the predictive policing that it's quieter now here for you? Well, we like to hope so. You know, we, we've experienced some we've experienced some significant reductions in a lot of our target crime areas, and actually, a slower day like this gives us more of that proactive time and be seen uh, by the neighborhood and deal with maybe some of the smaller issues before they become larger issues. What's going on, fellas? How are you? Do you really think that the neighborhood wants to hear the music? It's a question you can answer. What we're trying to do actually is not increase arrests, but increase police presence in high risk areas. What we hope to see is a police car at a high risk area stops a crime from occurring and a potential burglar walks by, sees, their, uh, sees the car there and says, well, I'm not going to break into this house now because there's a police car right in front of it. We're not trying to predict the people, we're trying to predict the locations and get the, yeah. the police cars there before the event and then it, nothing happens. <laughs> so no arrests come of it, no interesting anything comes of it, but ideally no crime occurs there as well. Less crime, better health care, and cities build according to better designs. But will our data be used for less positive purposes too?
most people are not aware of what's going on, so mm -hmm. there's no reason to be worried. But also, the fact is, is not that much really bad is happening at this point, okay? Um, but that isn't likely to be the true case in the future unless we do something about it now. And the, the thing to do about it is to treat it like money yeah. so that it has permissions and it's, it's regulated, it's flow. It's, it's not rocket science, right? It's really just recognizing that this is an important asset and it needs to be shared so we can get the public goods and it needs to be under individual control so people can feel safe. Yeah. Um, uh, the way we do with money, the way we do with many things. If we regard our personal data as valuable, and rules are put into place similar to the rules concerning money, it will be harder to abuse the data. But it can also help to maintain the economy as a whole. Since the 19th century, there's been this anxiety that someday technology would get good enough that it would throw people out of work, right? And then the answer to that has always been, well, no, it's just that there'll be new ways to make a living that are better than the old ways. So, uh, and that's a very good answer, but the problem is, as things become highly automated and highly efficient because of digital technology, can we still make that answer work? If the cars are driving themselves, uh, if your cameras are printed out by a 3D printer instead of manufactured in a factory, is there anybody still making a living? And the only possible answer is that you make a living from your information, because the information is what becomes valuable in a highly advanced society. More and more people are beginning to realize that there is value in our personal data. Numerous small businesses and startups, such as Personal.com, Qui, and Privacy Fix, are working on regaining control of our personal data. Matt Hogan, a former bond trader on Wall Street, also became aware of the increasing value of personal data. He established DataCoop, a website where people can store their own personal data and put them up for sale. The people who were winning on Wall Street were the people with the best data, the people with the best information, and people who were most fit to analyze that information and quickly make decisions. And you're seeing that played out in the advertising space right now, you know, where you know, companies that are operating with good data are making informed good decisions that are leading to you know, more sales and more conversions and whatnot. Um, I think ultimately that ends up coming to the consumer as well, where we're going to be empowered with our data and we get to make decisions on our data. I think personal data is, is hugely valuable and, and I think we're in the, the first inning of figuring out you know, what that value is and, and how, how much value can be derived from personal data. Um, you know, up until now, you think about data, it's really been the domain of large enterprise and government and um, you know, players that have a lot of capital and infrastructure. And you know, I think the democratization of data is, is going to happen and is happening right now and it should unleash you know, a tidal wave of value. What's interesting about this is that, so far as I can tell, I've been trying to calculate this, that value is going up. Uh, what I ask is, will it ever reach what we would call the poverty line? Will it ever be, will, will, will the average person's information be worth as much as the poverty line in a given country at some point? And I hypothesize, yeah, maybe in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, but at the point where just your information is worth enough to bring you out of poverty, then we have an option to think about a society in a new way. And this is what I'm trying to get people to think about. Ich hoffe, dass Ihnen das Video gefallen hat. Klicken Sie hier, um das empfohlene Video anzusehen. Bitte abonnieren Sie unseren Kanal, um Updates über VPRO-Doc zu erhalten. <lacht>